Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to see everybody back in here, and you've all had your coffee, and uh, for those of you out in television, I know a lot of you wish you were back there on the last row, and uh, some of you feel like you are, but anyway... Uh, we want to welcome you to a Bible study, and we trust that you'll just take your Bible and pen and study with us and compare Scripture with Scripture and then become skilled and share it with others. That's the name of the game, is to not just keep it, but to be able to share it. Again, we want to thank you for your letters, your financial help, your prayers, everything, because without you, we could never do it. And uh, for those of you here in the studio, of course, we're always appreciative that you come in and that you too are so supportive of everything that the Lord is doing through us. Okay, let's go right back. We left off. We're a Bible study, and we're in 2 Peter chapter 1. And again, for those of you who may have just tuned in in the last minute or two or last program or two, we're looking at these little epistles of 1 Peter and James and, and uh, John and how they are all addressed primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to Jewish believers who are as yet not part and parcel of the gospel of the grace of God. They haven't heard of that, but they are still meeting in synagogues and uh, they're still probably practitioners of the law. The temple is still working, remember. That hasn't been destroyed yet. And uh, Peter has never said a word about, not their, about their not being under the law, as Paul does. And so these are the people to whom these little epistles are addressed. All right, now verse 16, here's a verse that we can just take to heart for ourselves, just as true for us as it was for these Jews, where Peter says, verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Now, you know, that's what the scoffer claims the Bible is. Well, I don't dare use the word that I think they are, but uh, how can anybody be so foolish when we know that this book is so intricately put together? Intricately. It all fits. And then they try to tell us that it was all concocted around the campfires of antiquity and some of these foolish statements. But Peter hits the nail on the head. These are not cunningly devised fables. When we, Paul Peter says, made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, lest you think that I've been stretching the envelope when I've been stressing all the time that these little epistles are looking forward to the coming of Christ again. Now, he, remember, he's been crucified. He's ascended back to glory. We're in those years just after that. And so they know that he's going to have to return and yet set up the kingdom, which we would call now the second coming. But turn with me to Jude, the little book of Jude. Only one chapter, so I can't give you chapter and verse. It's just Jude, verse 14. Jude, right next to Revelation. Jude, verse 14. Interesting verse. And remember, Jude is in the same category as Peter, James, and John. <clears throat> and he writes, verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, when he said, Behold, the Lord cometh, with ten thousands of his saints. Well, what was that? That's a reference to the second coming. And that's what Peter is referring to, that he's going to be coming with power and glory. All right, back to Second Peter again then, verse 16. For he says, we've made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They know that he's coming. Even though Peter has now realized that he probably won't live to see it, he's going to be martyred. But for these people to whom he's writing, they can still expect everything to happen in their lifetime. All right, reading on in verse 16, then, the coming of Christ. <clears throat> but he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They got a glimpse of what he's going to be like 
when he returns. Just a glimpse, because after all, you want to remember that when Christ came at his first coming, he didn't lay aside his deity, he didn't lay aside any of his righteousness or his holiness, but he did lay aside his glory. He did not walk up and down the dusty roads of Israel, shining brighter than the noonday sun. But Peter, James, and John did get a glimpse of it at the Transfiguration, and of course that's back in Matthew chapter 17. We looked at it briefly a couple tapings ago, I think. But this is what Peter is referring to in, in his letter when he says that we saw a glimpse of his majesty. Matthew 17. <coughs> In fact, you might as well go up to the last verse of chapter 6. That would be verse 28, honey, in chapter 16. <coughs> Matthew 16, verse 28. During his earthly ministry now. And he says, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here. And of course he's referring to the twelve. There be some standing here who shall not taste of death, until they see, physically, the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now that threw a curve at them, didn't it? That there would be some of them who would not die until they would see the coming of the kingdom. <clears throat> now drop down in chapter 17 and we get what he was talking about. Six days later, <coughs> six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart. That would be one of the mountains of Israel. Verse 2. And he was transfigured. He was just immediately changed from his common physical appearance to his glorious. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. Now that's not a stretch on words. That was just a glimpse of His glory. That was just a glimpse of His power. See? All right, and His face did sign as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. And then in the midst of all that, there appeared Moses and Elijah talking with Him. Well, this is what Peter is making reference to, that he and James and John had the privilege of just getting this glimpse of a foreview of the glory that is yet to follow. All right, so back to 2 Peter, chapter 1, and now coming on into verse 17 again. For he, verse 17, y'all got it, honey? 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice unto him, from the excellent glory. And what did the voice say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. My goodness, what an experience. See? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, when else did that happen? At His baptism. The same identical thing. When the voice from heaven said word for word, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now verse 18, and this voice which came from heaven we heard. Quite an experience, don't you know? See, we, we live by faith, don't we? We live by faith, not by sight. But see, over and over throughout Israel's history, quite a few of the Jews saw God in one way or another. We know Abraham did, we know Moses did, and uh, Elijah probably did. And so various of the patriarchs saw God in human form back there. And then, of course, at his baptism was a special event. But at the transfiguration was something, I think, that was so mind-boggling that Peter, James, and John probably took a long time getting over it. All right, so Peter rehearses now in verse 18 that we were with him in that holy mount, in that transfiguration experience. Now verse 19 is a verse that I've always really hung on. As great as that experience was, 
And that was exhilarating. That was proof that this Jesus of Nazareth was who he claimed to be when he was transfigured right there before him and heard the voice from heaven on top of all that. But look at the next verse. And we have a more sure. Now, what does that tell you? Do we have to have exhilarating experiences like the transfiguration to believe? No. We can take all this by faith. We don't have to have sight. We don't have to have experiences. We take it by faith. And that's why I think in this age of grace, we have so little of the supernatural, if any, is because now God has given us the Word of God and He expects us to believe it. He expects us. And that's why it's going to be so awful for people of unbelief. Because all He's expected the human race to do is to believe what He has said. And when they refuse to believe, then it's almost a slap in the face, as it were, and tell him, but I don't believe it. All right, now look at this next verse. Even though as great as that transfiguration experience was, Peter can yet say, again by inspiration, never forget this, and we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Well, now, who is the day star? The Lord Jesus Christ. And how does he arise in our heart? By faith. We take it all by faith. And he becomes real to us. He's with us moment by moment. Now, I know we were just talking at break time. Once in a while, things will happen to families, and I can appreciate when they begin to wonder, you know, where is God's grace? When just one horrible thing after another can happen, and, and that's a human reaction. But on the other hand, we have to come right back and claim the promises of God that are sure that in spite of whatever may happen, He's aware of us, He knows, and He's with us, and He'll never leave us nor forsake us. All right, and so he is already in our walk of faith. He is the day star that has already arisen in our hearts. All right, now then, verse 20. Here is that which is more sure than even his proof of his transfiguration, that no forth telling of the scripture is of no in private interpretation, or a better translation, I think, is of human origin. We can look at this book and it is more of a manifestation of who God is and what He has done and what He is to us than the transfiguration was to Peter, James, and John. Now, I know that's a strong statement. But listen, this book is so refined, it is so intricately put together that we never have to doubt it. And it just proves itself precept upon precept. And even though the scoffers may scream and ridicule it, yet we who see the intricacy of it, we know it is the Word of God. And we know it's true. And we know that everything it says is going to happen, is going to happen. We don't have to have any doubt whatsoever. And so I like to make that comparison. Yes, Peter, James, and John saw Christ transfigured. They saw His glory with their physical eyes. But we've got something that's even more sure, and that is the Word of God itself. Now, that's exhilarating, isn't it? All right, now then, let's go on. Time is moving. So, verse 20, knowing this first and above everything, that no prophecy, now the word prophecy here in the New Testament does not usually mean telling the future. It means speaking forth. That's why in 1 Corinthians 14, the greatest gift was Prophecy, the giving of the gift to speak forth the Word of God before it was printed. Now, you all remember, I'm always emphasizing, there was about 18 years from the time that Paul began his ministry among the Gentiles until he writes his first epistle. So for 18 years, what did the early believers depend on? Gifted men who could speak forth the Word of God, and that's why it was the primary gift. All right, so now here again, verse 20, that no speaking forth of the Scripture. 
<coughs> is of any private or human origin. Nobody dreamed this up and then spoke it. And then verse 21 is the answer. For the prophecy, or again, the speaking forth, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy, separated men of God spake as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that's the inspiration of Scripture. And you can pick it up all the way through. And, and I'm, I'm sometimes, I don't ridicule very often, but when, when people will make foolish, stupid statements, like Luke must have been a tremendous keeper of a diary, or he could have never written the Gospels in the book of Acts. Now, to me, that is ridiculous. No writer of Scripture went back to notes in a diary. They didn't write on what they had remembered. They didn't write on the basis of hearsay. They wrote as the Holy Spirit funneled those thoughts through their mind. And they were moved in that. That's the inspiration of the Scripture. Otherwise, how in the world could Moses write about creation which took place 2,500 years before? He did. How in the world could Moses write about his own death which was out in front of him? But he did. That's the inspiration of the Scripture, see? In the same way with all the writings of Scripture. How could these men name King Cyrus 150 years before he was ever born? By inspiration. How could Daniel lay out so perfectly the coming Gentile empires, one after the other, long before they happen, by inspiration. And so it is throughout this whole book, that which is still future, it is just as reliable as that which is past. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit moved holy men to write the things that God wanted written. And of course, Paul puts it in I think the second Timothy, we won't take time to look it up, but how's Paul put it? For all scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, is what? Inspired of God and is profitable for reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So Paul says the same thing. All right, now then I guess we can go on into chapter 2, honey. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. But, now you know in the original there was no chapter break. But, horror of horrors, what has happened to the truth of the inspired scriptures? Oh, it's been attacked and underwritten and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, has been undermined by what kind of people? False teachers. Next verse. Here it is. Chapter 2, verse 1. But, even though the scripture is true, even though holy men of God were moved by the Spirit to write, but false prophets, false teachers, were also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now this Peter, who else says the same thing? Paul. Paul is constantly reminding his early converts, beware. Beware, they're coming. In fact, his greatest warning is in Galatians 1. Let's go back and look at it. Oh, listen. God has had to put up with the satanic attacks against himself and against his program and against his word since day one. And it's inspired by the adversary, Satan. All right, but now you've got Galatians chapter 1, <coughs> verse 6. I will use this over and over. But I don't have to apologize for it because it is always apropos. Every day of the week you've got this kind of thing going on, even in the Christian community. Verse 6 of Galatians 1, I marvel, he's amazed, that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ, that is, through Paul's preaching. Now remember, he's writing to Gentiles who had just come out of paganism, idolatry, and all that was part of that. And now Paul has got them established in his gospel of grace, and here come the false teachers. 
immediately. The false teachers come right in and undermine the apostles' teaching. And they're falling for it. And he says, I'm amazed. And you're falling into another gospel. But now verse 7. But it's not really another. It's not something totally different. But they have taken what I have brought you, and they have, what? Perverted it. They've polluted it with outside material. All right? So he said, it's not another. It's not a totally different gospel. But there are some that trouble you and would pervert or pollute the gospel of Christ. But now look what Paul puts on these false teachers. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you. In other words, in its purity. And that's what he called it in Corinthians. He said, I didn't come to you with a false product. I came to you with the pure truth of the gospel. And here he's reminding the Galatians the same thing, see? That if you're going to partake of anything but the truth of Paul's gospel, and if there become any unto you, an angel or whoever, then preaches any other gospel, verse 8, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. They're under the anathema of God. False teachers. And all oh, the world is false. Full of them. Always has been. Oh my goodness. Let's see. Where can I go? I want to show you. Uh, I was just talking with somebody on the phone about it last night. And, and what a heartache. What a heartache. I hope I can find it. It's either in 2 Timothy or... Uh, yeah, 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. I begin to think it might be in Titus. But it's in 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. <clears throat> what a heart-breaking statement. And again, inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15. And this is what Paul writes to Timothy. This thou knowest, that all they... And I'm a stickler for words. I believe it... I believe it took every one of them. I think that all of these believers that had, that had become followers of the Apostle Paul had all turned against him and had followed the false teachers. Oh, we're seeing it today. Wholesale. Wholesale. The further out in left field these guys get, the bigger the crowds. All right? And he says, This thou knowest, that all they who are in Asia, now remember Asia is Asia Minor, that's present day Turkey. All they who are in Asia be turned away from me. Of whom Phygelus and Hermogenes, of course, were the leaders. In verse 16, the Lord give mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refresh me. But nevertheless, coming back to 2 Peter now, it's always been this way. Let me remind you, how long was it after Abel had brought the right kind of a sacrifice and was accepted of God? Cain, on the other hand, brought the wrong sacrifice and was not accepted, which immediately put a wall of demarcation between those two young brothers how long was it until Satan intervened with the crime of murder? Not long. Not long. And old Cain rose up and killed Abel. Well, who prompted Cain to kill Abel? Well, the devil did, of course. And why? Because Satan thought if he could get rid of that very first progeny in the promises that that would end it all and he'd have the victory before it ever started. Well, that's the way it's been all the way up through human history. As soon as God reveals something, Satan attacks it with everything he's got. And that's why I'm always reminding people everywhere I go, why in the world do you suppose Israel has always had so much opposition to satanic power? Why do you suppose the world in general tonight would like to drive them into the sea and be rid of the problem? Satanic power. But it's not going to happen because God is always victorious. He's always overcome. But it's always been enough to lead certain numbers, the majority, really, the majority astray. All right, back to Second Peter. 
Verse 1 again. Oh, the warning. The warning against false teachers. But in spite of the divine revelation of the writers of Scripture, there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately or secretly, they're not going to come out and just get into a pulpit and say, hey, I'm going to lead you astray today. No, they come in secretly, underhandedly, and they bring in damnable or condemnational heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And they bring upon themselves a swift destruction. They're not going to get by. Verse 2, And many, many, not a few, many. Paul said, all, Peter says, many shall follow their pernicious ways. Goodness sakes, if you know anything about medicine, you should know what the word pernicious means. We've got a disease called what? Pernicious anemia. What's the disease, pernicious anemia? Well, it's a disease that eats away the red blood cells. And that's why when someone gets anemic, they lose their color because pernicious anemia is constantly chewing up and destroying the red blood cell. Well, the word means the same thing here. These false teachers are perniciously chewing up the truth so that it becomes useless. Now, that should give you a good example, shouldn't it? Pernicious. And that's what he says. And so they shall bring in these terrible heresies, denying the Lord that brought them, and many will follow their pernicious ways, these ways that are chewing up and spitting out the truth. All right, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. My goodness, if you read anything at all, you know this is what we're up against. I read it on every hand, that this is exactly what they're doing with the truth. They're chewing it up and spitting it aside. All right? Oh, my goodness. Only 30 seconds left. Verse 3. And through covetousness. Now we talked about coveting the last half hour, didn't we? It just pops up in Scripture because it's the number one sin of the human race. It's the one that Paul said opened him up to his sinful state. That when the law said, Thou shalt not covet, then Paul or Saul at that time suddenly realized that he was guilty, as guilty can be. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.